excited to have you here for tonight's WordWorks. WordWorks is um, really a signature series for Hugo House because we exist to open the literary world to everyone who loves books or has a drive to write. And part of what we do is encouraging people, all people, to delve into stories, um, explore memories, write poems, um, to, be, to be a storyteller. So it's particularly apt and thrilling that tonight we have Dr. Charles Johnson, whose recent book, The Way of the Writer, is full of writerly wisdom to guide people through the writing process. And, uh, and it's also full of other kinds of wisdom. And um, it's a terrific writer. It's a fabulous book. We have copies of it available from Elliot Bay somewhere out there. Um, and in case you don't know, we're just a block away from where the new Hugo House is going to be opening sometime later this summer. We're super excited about it. Yay! <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you here who have supported this project. We're really lucky that our founders and early supporters are making it possible for our little tiny organization to actually own our own home. That's pretty unusual for an organization our size. So, um, so the drill tonight is we're going to have um, uh, interactive with the audience. We're also going to have some possible interview questions. At some point, we will break for an intermission, um, probably about 40 minutes in, um, because I think you'll want to take a break. And the bar is open, so you'll definitely want to take a break. Um, so uh, Charles Johnson is being joined tonight um, and will be introduced by Margo Kahn is the author of the biography, Horses That Buck, and the co-editor of the anthology, This is the Place, Women Writing About Home. She's also a long-time associate of Hugo House and has been a wonderful part of our Writers' Center. And with that, I will just ask Margo to come out and do an introduction, and then we'll shuffle the stage as suits the two of you. Thanks, Tree. Good evening. Charles Johnson has published widely and is the author of four novels, three story collections, a young adult book, numerous collections of nonfiction, and over 20 screenplays. It's these kind of writers I most admire who are able to traffic in every genre there is. His novel, Middle Passage, won the National Book Award for Fiction in 1990, making him the first African-American male to win the prize since Ralph Ellison in 1953. His novel, Ox Herding Tale, was awarded the 1983 Washington State Governor's Award for Literature. And The Sorcerer's Apprentice, a story collection, was one of five finalists for the 1987 Penn Faulkner Award. Being and Race won a 1989 Governor's Award for Literature. His short fiction is included in the O. Henry Prize stories, the Best American Short Stories, Best American Short Stories of the 80s, and he was named in a survey conducted by the University of Southern California to be one of the 10 best short story writers in America. His short fiction and essays are much anthologized. In 2001, Dr. Johnson received the Pacific Northwest Writers Association's Achievement Award for Distinguished Professional Achievement and for Enhancing the Stature of Northwest Literature. He's also the latest author to be interviewed in the famous Paris Review Author Interviews. It's in the current issue of that magazine, and it's a really big honor. A long time ago, maybe 10 years or so, but who's counting? Um, I read with Dr. Johnson, he probably doesn't remember, and nor does he have any reason to, given the hundreds of readings and lectures and presentations he's done over the course of his career. But it was an event for Humanities Washington, and I was the opener, and he was the closer. And at the end of the evening, I asked him 
to inscribe a book for me. And it was this one, Turning the Wheel, his collection of essays on Buddhism and writing. And he wrote, for Margot, with gratitude for the great pleasure of reading with you, Charles Johnson. And I have to say, the generosity of those words really struck me that evening. And they've stayed with me all these years um, because I think they're a testament to Dr. Johnson's character, um, his breadth and depth and love of learning, his respect for the journey an artist takes in her craft, and his great support of the community, the greater artistic community. So it is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Johnson. something a little different. Uh, this event may have been billed as a lecture, and I, during the course of my life, have given lots of lectures. I taught at UW for 33 years and, you know, visit other schools. Lectures are fine. It's a one-way communication, though. I talk, you sit, you passively listen, you know, 40 minutes, 30 minutes, and maybe there's 10 minutes for Q&A. And that format works. I, I was just doing that, actually, for three weeks in India um, from late February to early March, um, where I traveled with writer Sharon Skeeter in the first row to nine different schools and universities. Um, and I gave a couple of lectures while I was there. But what I much prefer to do in retirement now is talk to people. Is talk to people, you know? I don't want a one-way communication. But we have to have something to talk about. So I should say a little something, maybe read a little something, right, from um, that book, The Way of the Writer, that'll get us thinking about writing and storytelling. And then I want to open it up for a Q&A, for a dialogue. I want to hear what kind of questions you've got. And I can assure you, as opposed to a lecture, with a Q&A format like this, we will cover far more territory than we could do with a you know, single monologue. So I'm going to read a few words. And please be patient with me. I may have to put my glasses on. Maybe not. <laughs> Every story begins with some sort of problem or conflict. If for some reason you don't like that word conflict, we can say that when the story opens, our protagonist finds himself or herself in a state of disequilibrium. It is possible to begin a story with a character in a state of equilibrium, but he or she must soon find that state of affairs disturbed. There is something the protagonist wants, needs, or desires. There is something missing in his world, and he must acquire it. Or something is intruded upon his world, and he must deal with that in order to regain equilibrium. And this cannot be any old conflict the writer wishes to attach to his character. As a conflict, it must be anchored in the specificity and texture of the character's background and biography. Something else important to say is that we have chosen this particular moment in a character's life to dramatize because it is at this moment that the character is living for high stakes. The key word here is change. The ground situation, that's a term from John Barth that I like, as opposed to conflict, propels the protagonist into a process of transformation. He and the reader cannot come out of what I call the alpha narrative as clean as when they went in. This is the very definition of what we mean when we say that a character is round and not flat. He or she is round because during the story, and based on its events, he or she is forced to evolve, and so must all the other major characters in the story. 
In this sense, we can say that in the alpha narrative, plot and character are perfectly united because character is the engine of plot. The conflict or ground situation arises from the specificity of this particular individual and it is the first good idea the writer has, the one that sets everything else in motion. I always told my students that in this first stage of the story, the reader and writer find themselves in the realm of possibility. The writer has countless choices he or she can make as he or she decides who his characters are, what conflicts they have, and what sort of world they inhabit. But with each sentence, with each detail, he places on the page, with each he despoils those possibilities. This gradual limiting of the possible occurs as the writer wonders, given this character in this situation and with this specific problem to solve, what might happen next? Well, what happens is the protagonist attempts, <laughs> what happens is the protagonist attempts to resolve his or her problem. If he succeeds, that's the end of the story and maybe also the end of your career. <laughs> so the writer's job is to completely frustrate him. Perhaps his attempt to overcome whatever conflict he has opens into a larger and more difficult problem. Or he comes to realize that his initial problem was far more complex than he ever dreamed. By this time, we are no longer in the realm of possibility. We are now in the middle of the story, in the realm of probability, where all the details and decisions the writer made in the beginning create a causal connection and profluence between events, a connection that we as readers feel is logical and inevitable based on all that has come before. Here, in the middle of the tale, it is crucial that a writer comes up with a second good idea, one that deep deepens and further complicates the actualization of the potential contained in the story's premise. For a reader, and often for the writer, this second good idea is never experienced as predictable. We never feel there in the middle of the story that we saw this new series of developments coming. Yet, despite our surprise over what happens next, the reader feels this new dramatic territory in the story flows organically from all the events that preceded it. Most likely, the writer himself didn't fully see the events in the middle of the story until he got there. In other words, if the writer is faithful to the minute details he has established in the beginning, if he is tracing carefully every nuance of character and situation, how, like in my novel Middle Passage, does Captain Falcon eat? How does he eat his soup? What eccentricities does the first mate Peter Kringle have? What superstitions and rituals do sailors follow when they are at sea? If you follow those, those details carefully, um, you will be continually surprised by how the actors in your story are behaving. Now, if you're not surprised by their behavior, by what they say and do in the middle of the story, then I doubt that your readers will be surprised either. If, you know, if you're not surprised, you're not asking enough hard questions. The excitement and suspense of discovery must be there for the writer first. You get up every day burning to get back to your computer just so you can see what this ensemble of characters is going to do next and to one another. Ideally, as the writer moves toward the end of an alpha narrative, as I call it, he feels as if he's not creating or making up anything at all. At this point, the story has entered the realm of pure necessity, where events play themselves out with all the rigor of a logical proof. Here, at the end, the writer is more like a witness or a reporter than someone who is trying to tell a story. All he's doing now is transcribing what he sees unfolding before his mind's eye. The only things that can happen are things predestined by the decisions the writer made in chapter one. This final phase of the story also requires a third and last good idea to wrap things up. But by this time, after all that has transpired, the writer should be able to find that idea with ease. 
The structure that I've just outlined for you resembles a funnel. It's large and wide at the beginning and gets narrow and narrow, narrow as we move through the realm of possibility and then it's quite small at the end when the potential of the story's premise has been exhausted. This is a structure that all storytellers know by instinct. Books on how to write fiction always try to explain this creative process, but usually, I think, they fail. The process is all about asking questions, digging deeper into character and event. In my experience, I find that when a novel fails, or when students get stuck in their stories and can't figure out what happens next, it's almost always because they fail to fully define and understand the character and his or her conflict and the ground situation in the beginning. Or the story may fail because in the middle, the writer hasn't conjured a second good idea inherent in the material. Or finally, the story may fail at the end because the writer by now is just exhausted and imposes on, on his characters events that have not grown logically and systematically and organically from all that came before. As writers, we live for the moment when the powers that be hand us a story so rich that exploring it fully becomes the most legal fun we can have. <laughs> There's other ways to have fun that are illegal. Um, I, can, I see the techniques and um, elements of craft that I've taught writing students at UW as simply being tools to prepare them for the time when such a narrative drops into their laps. But for that to happen, I told my students they must see themselves first and foremost as storytellers. I want the feeling of alpha narratives in the process of fictional discovery to become second nature for them because I know that if they accomplish this, if this way of conceiving a story becomes a habit, then a way of life, technique will take care of itself and they will create stories that will be read and talked about and even retold when their own great-great-grandchildren are very, very old. Thank you for being patient. Okay, I saw a hand way up in the back. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Hickey, Charles, uh, it's so great to see you. Uh, uh, Charles uh, was my instructor in grad school for a year-long novel writing class, and you had just won the National Book Award, so we were all kind of living vicariously through you. And it was an awesome experience. A couple years later, you did a reading, it might have been at the new bookstore or Elliot or something, and I, I said, I hadn't seen you in a while, and I said, sir, please sign my book, and you signed the book, and you said, Mike, great to see you, stop calling me sir. <laughs> <laughs> and you also did a nice book jacket testimonial from my first novel a long time ago, so I, I, I just, I don't know, I'm very indebted to you. Um, one of your great influences was John Gardner. Uh, Gardner, if I'm remembering right, was a teacher of yours at SIU Carbondale. That's right. And uh, there were two books through that year of graduate school that, that we read. I believe it was Art of Fiction and On Moral Fiction. And I think Gardner, uh, I've been teaching now at South for years, and I think Gardner's like one of my real influential, uh, influential teachers about writing in the process, as, as you have become. I was just wondering if you would maybe share with the audience a little bit about Gardner and the influence that he was on you. Well, first, I would say thank you. This, this gentleman here, you know, one of the beauties of being a teacher for half your life is that you see people who pass through your classroom or former students, whatever the case, they grow up, of course, <laughs> they, uh, they have kids, they have families, but then they become teachers themselves, professors, or published writers. I have quite a number of former students who've gone on to become quite successful. Uh, some of the names you know, they're local people, David Gooderson, for example, and many others. Um, and so I, I feel a really tremendous sense of joy that we could have set, shared this time, you know what I'm saying, together during this journey. So thank you for being here. The question, you know, John Gardner was, he was the only writing teacher I ever had, actually. 
other than a high school teacher I had when I was a junior named Marie Claire Davis. She was publishing in the Saturday Evening Post when I was in high school. That was what we heard about her. And she started a creative writing class. And I took it with a buddy. The buddy wanted to take it. And I was a cartoonist. You know, I wasn't really interested in becoming a writer, but I took it. You know, I, I really wasn't. I just wanted to draw. But I took it with him. And me and my buddy, um, we would talk during the class, you know. And poor Marie's up there, you know, she's, you know, she was wonderful. I mean, she put um, Joyce Carey's um, uh, Art and Reality in front of us. Didn't ask us to read it, but I read it. I thought, oh, this is very interesting. I'll just write about art, <laughs> okay? Maybe that will be fun to do someday. Um, but she took my first three stories in her class and she published it in the literary section, you know, of um, my high school paper. Um, and uh, those were my first publications, 1965, when I was 17 years old. Um, and so I feel indebted to her. She, uh, I set an award, an award up for her at my old high school, Evanston Township High School, which I think I'm mean, going, maybe going back to um, after my next book comes out on May 1st. Um, and every year, Marie would come from Florida to shake the hand of the winner of that award. Every year she would do that. And then when she passed away, um, her husband sent me all of her papers. She had been working to be a writer since the 1930s. You know, I have like five boxes that he couldn't have around because they reminded him of her. And I'm presently trying to find a home for them, some place that will archive them. Uh, they're in my garage right now. I've tried lots of places. You know, the Evanston Historical Society, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but that was, that was the only teacher I ever had other than John Gardner. And, you know, there's an old saying, I guess, um, when the time is right, the guru, up, the guru appears, right? I'd written six novels in two years, uh, one every 10-week academic quarter, because I didn't know any better. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, 10 pages a day, yeah, five, five days a week, you know, and you keep that pace up. On the weekends, you take a little time to revise, uh, do some research. In 10 weeks, you're like, you'll have a novel, okay? It's not that hard. Um, to, <laughs> it's not. I mean, 10 pages a day, just do it. You glue your seat, you know, your, the seat of your pants to the seat of the chair. But what I needed after six novels was to learn something that editors said I didn't know as well as I, I could have known, and that was voice and rhythm. Voice and rhythm. So I saw a course for God, Gardner in the newspaper. Some of my friends had taken classes with it, and they were English majors. I was a journalism major and then a philosophy <coughs> major. And I heard stories about John, there were rumors about John. Um, he wrote for 15 years without getting published. It was really tar hard, but when I saw the ad for his course, and I had called him up and said, can I come over you know, um, to your course on writing? He said, sure, come on over. It was a farmhouse, Southern Illinois. Um, and when I went over there, John had just published Gr Grindel. That was just out. Grindel was just out, and that made his critical reputation. And I remember seeing on the fireplace shelf in his farmhouse the book that was coming out in a month or two. It was, it showed, he showed it to me, he said, look at this. <laughs> and it was Sunlight Dialogues, and that became his first bestseller. Um, so I had John looking over my shoulder for about nine months when I wrote my first novel, which was actually my seventh novel. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's called apprentice novels. <laughs> you know, it's apprentice work. Um, and then what happened to Gardner? For 10 years, 72, to his motorcycle accident in 82, he was like this comet across the landscape of American literature. He's publishing book because, because he had to wait 15 years to really break through, he had books in his closet. They were just dying to be published. So he was doing two, sometimes two books a year maybe three books a year. I have all of his books on my shelf. I ordered all his books when I studied with him on um, medieval studies, um, you know, studies of Chaucer, um, the Gawain poet. I, I just read all of that because I felt, okay, if I'm going to study with some guy, I need to know <laughs> what he's been saying out there publicly, right? Um, so it actually was John that got me interested in anything in terms of medieval studies. Um, but for though, that period of time, you know, he was published book after book. And then there was a controversial book. The controversial book was um, on moral fiction, which his publisher Knopf did not want to do because he criticizes a whole lot of authors being published by Knopf. And he made a lot of enemies by doing that. 
So that is, that taught me a lesson. Be careful about what you say about other writers <laughs> in public because they may get really angry at you. Um, and then he had the motorcycle accident in 82. Um, and the book he left behind, it was a manuscript actually. It, it was, you know, to talk about the art of fiction. Um, when he died, that was a manuscript that he was leaving with his students at SUNY Binghamton. He would work on it. You know, uh, and, and leave it in the English department for the students to read. If they had questions, they could make little marks on it and so forth. You know, it was going back and forth like that. Well, when he died, it was not a publishable manuscript. So what happened is my friend Nicholas Del Banco, who is uh, who basically created the uh, creative writing program, the MFA program at the University of Michigan, and who is a fine writer himself, Nick took the manuscript and pulled it into shape. We wouldn't have. The Art of Fiction, if not for Nick Del Banco, who I think has a new novel coming out in the fall, he told me. Anyway, I could talk forever about Gardner, but <laughs> I think we should have, hey, this is our time, some more questions. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm working on a biography, and I'm wondering if you could talk about the alpha narrative in terms of nonfiction and biography. I'm not sure I can. <laughs> I'm not sure I... You said biography, right? I think you can do it. This is my question. I, I think you can. Oh, it works. Oh, okay. I think you can. Don't you? Tell him why. I think you can talk about the alpha narrative in biography because it is, I think if it's done well, it's so similar to just replace, just forget about biography. It's the same as a novel if when it's good, right? You have your main character and, and they want something and something happens to them. Yep. And then you say all the things that you say here <laughs> in this book. Just get this book. <laughs> I have a question for the audience, actually. How many of you will have the um, uh, honor of being a student of Dr. Johnson? Okay, only a couple. And, and how many writers are in the audience? A whole bunch. Okay, and how many people have on this book? Oh, my God. Thank you. Okay, I everybody else, you. you should get it. No, but I, I think that you can talk about the alpha narrative as it relates to biography because it is so similar. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think she's absolutely right. Um, I shouldn't say any more, but I will say this. <laughs> I, I spent seven years on a novel about Martin Luther King Jr. called Dreamer, right? And I did that because I didn't think I really knew him, even though he came to the Chicago area when I was in high school for his first northern campaign. I didn't really know the guy. I wanted to know him and, and write about dimensions of him that I didn't think other people were, were appreciative of, like the fact that the guy was a theologian, you know, that the fact he was a Boston personalist, right? There's so, such complexity to this man, you know, that he's usually portrayed as a kind, grandfatherly figure, you know, a leader of the civil rights movement for black people. But he, this guy was the nation's preacher. And how did he get to be that, is my question. Now, what are the other questions resonant in his 14-year public ministry? I didn't know. So I spent seven years working on that book, which is now 20 years old. And uh, one of the books that helped me a whole lot was Stephen Oates' Let the Trumpet Sound. I don't know if you know that book, but it reads like a novel. It reads like a novel. It is a narrative, beginning, middle, and end, suspense, even though you know the story, right? When I was on a book tour, when Dreamer came out, I went to Amherst, and that's where Oates teaches. And he came to the bookstore where I was signing books, and he told me this is the best book on King he'd ever seen. But he told me something else, namely, that as a historian, he was eager to, this is 20 years ago now, incorporate more narrative techniques that novelists are all familiar with in the writing of history. So I think that you, history's a story. His story, her story, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a story. That's what it is. Um, you just have to work at it slightly different in terms of your research and getting all your facts right and double-checking facts. You can't make stuff up. But in there, in the structure, um, uh, the structure of novels, the way we do short stories, the way we do that, can be, can be conjured from history, from, from a life. 
That, that raises a curious question huh, to me. Do lives really fit neatly into beginning, middle, and end, rising conflict to resolution structures? <laughs> and this lady, the person's shaking. <laughs> so, so what we're doing is an interpretation, right? We're selecting certain things and not showing others. Um, you know, it, I, I don't know what to say. Um, it, we're not telling lies <laughs> when we impose a structure on experience. But we ought to be humble and at the same time realize this is not the whole picture. This is not the whole life. Um, I'm very, very conscious of that when I write about real people. I can just take a slice and you, know, you, can, you can conjure a structure. It's going to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Or you can mess around with the end like some writers have done, alternate endings and so forth. But nevertheless, like, I say I'm Buddhist, okay? <laughs> and, um, um, I'm very suspicious sometimes of the power of language. Um, we're writers, this is our tools, we use them every day, but I also know, right, I also know that language can create illusions, that there's something in it, as one person said, like a spider's web. Um, so I always have that sense of epistemological humility. I know I don't know everything, and I'm real comfortable with that. <laughs> you know, I think the world we live in is a great mystery, and that every life in this room is enormously complex, enormously complex and varied and deep. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, take us off in that direction, but that's a thought I, I every time I sit down to write, I'm aware of. Yes? I'm kind of curious about uh, theme. When, um, you know, when you're writing about a character and you're getting to know that character and some sort of obstacle comes in the way of what that character wants, your story may go off in a completely different direction than you had intended. So how do you get back to, um, I mean, do you ever start a story wanting to say something, or do you just let the story tell you what it is you're trying to convey? Well, I, th I think if that happens, something gets in the way, you said, something arises, right? Well, some sort of, there's a conflict, as you described. Yeah. The character wants something, and there's some sort of obstacle in the way that probably may come as a, as a surprise to me as a writer what that thing is. See, I think that's the delight of the process. Yes, See, I, but, but so how did, so, but there's a tension, isn't there, between that and having some sort of theme that you want to discuss? Well, let's, you know, let's, look at, let's look at it this way. I think I, think I see it in the book, too. I, I, true, I do believe this that whatever we say about literary art, or art in general, there's two characteristics it has. And one is, um, it's all about problem solving, right? And that's why we study literature and other writers. So we see they've had you know, some of the same problems we've had, and we look at how they've solved the problem. So with my students, I would always say, okay, my students would critique each other. You know, somebody would have somebody else in class um, their work would be up that day, and, and one student would be the critiquer, and uh, you know, point out things about the manuscript. But one of the things I said to the critiquer is this, if you find a problem, you should come up with at least two solutions that the writer can use. Even better if you can get three, right? So part of the process is about problem solving and learning how to solve a problem, just like a plumber, okay? Just like a workman, just like a journey person, journeyman. The other part of the process that's great for me Discovery. This is a process of discovery. And if you're asking hard questions, right, as you move through it, your original outline have, may have to go out the window. Because what you've set up has led to something, you know, that you didn't expect. If you have that sense of surprise, the reader's going to have that sense of surprise. If you have that, I don't know, where is this going? And that's what's getting you up every morning to, the, you know, to, your, to your computer. That's a wonderful state to be in. You know, uh, you'd have to throw, I've done that, throw out the outline. I usually have to do that with a novel around page 100. Because I have a vague idea of what I want to do, maybe I'll do an outline. And, you know, after you've made all those decisions in the first part of the book, you're getting into the second part of the book, you've despoiled all those possibilities, you've gotten to know the characters better, hey, i got to look back at the outline. No, it's, he can't do this now. He can't do that n anymore. Um, we have to look at the material and then see from inside organically, based on the one or hundred pages that you've done, where it wants to go. That would, that would be my feeling about it. Oh, 
Cool. No, just a follow-up question. So are, when you say you have to throw out the outline, um, are you also saying you might have to throw out that initial theme that you thought you were going to write about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I truly believe that. Well, let me give you an example, not from my work, but Ralph Ellison. Um, his novel, Invisible Man, after all these decades, is not even a novel anymore. It's an American cultural artifact. You understand, understand something about what he's writing about, his subject, you know, you gotta go, you gotta make a witness uh, in front of that book. You gotta read it. You gotta, I've read that book so many times since I was an undergraduate. I even took it apart from the Inman Theater here. They wanted to adapt it for the stage, so I had to go through every image in that book, every scene. I mean, it's just, I know that thing like I almost know, you know, the back of my hand. But it took seven years, by the way, for him to write that. But that's not the book he was gonna write. He was going to write a book about the Tuskegee Airmen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought too. It's going to be about the Tuskegee Airmen. And then he said, he sat down and the first word, the words came out, I am an invisible man, boom. He's off in a whole <laughs> other direction, right? So he came, you know, with this desire to do this one project. I don't think he ever went back to the Tuskegee Airmen story. No, because that got to be more interesting. See, I think it's all about discovery. You know, there's nothing, I don't care how many stories you write or novels or anything like that. Every time you sit down, it's different. You got a repertoire now, you know, of tools. You got a suite of tools you can use that you develop over 52 years. That's how long I've been publishing stories. Um, but every time I sit down to write an essay or a short story or a novel or a screenplay, or whatever, no, I shouldn't say screenplay. Um, that's a whole different thing. Um, it, there's something new there. There's going to be new questions and new challenges. And more than likely, it'll stretch me. I'll have to learn something new to be able to do this story. So you're always growing. You know, you're always being pulled in a new direction. If we're talking about literary art, not necessarily formula fiction, okay, because there you got to follow a strict formula. Um, or even with screenplays, because the reason I put it to the side for the moment is because you're doing screenplays or teleplays, you're, you're a team player, you're, you're a hired gun, um, you take notes <laughs> from producers, and you know, you're not in fully control of this product the way you would be with a novel, your own novel or your own short, short story. Um, okay, having said that, I'll, I'll shut up. More, yeah, yes, oh, two. Uh, this lady was first, and then you, yes, ma'am. that your life goes in or the way that your mind works is not necessarily what I want to produce. So if I tend maybe towards something, like I think I tend towards something maybe that's dark or dystopian or whatever, but what I want to write is funny or not. What I want to produce is something else. And I feel like it's sometimes as I'm starting to write, because I'm such a new like, writer, that's like a laziness. Like I'm interested in a lot of things, not just that. My conscious mind wants to go in all these different directions, but the lazy mind, I'm also a Buddhist, oh. wants to go into these grooves that it's comfortable with. Oh. And so That's how, also called the monkey mind, probably. Yeah. Right. So how, <laughs> when you're writing and you're creating something, because when I'm journaling or I'm writing, I'll find that monkey mind taking over, how to stretch it, how to like work past that. Wow, that's interesting. I like, no, did, did, you understand her question? Yes. No. 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 <laughs> yes and no. Um, I'm wondering, see, I think this is really important. Um, I'm thinking about this in terms of Buddha Dharma now, because you just, you went there. And what you want is beginner's mind, as it's called. You don't want the conditioned mind. The one society has conditioned, or, you know, the media has conditioned, our families have conditioned. You don't want that repetitive, in the same groove, always mind. You want the beginner's mind that's like, almost like love, the mind of a child. You know, everything's fresh. We don't, we have not layered onto the phenomena or the subject interpretations. Other people's interpretations in particular. You want to see with unsealed eyes, with fresh vision. That's beginner's mind. So how do you do that? 
How do you do that? I'm asking. <laughs> How do you free up the conditioned mind? And I have this case. Do, do, do you meditate? You I, I do, and I actually find um, recently certain things I've been reading that kind of break that down that use pure words um, as a meditation. So I've been reading Frank Stanford. He's a poet, um, and he wrote this beautiful, epic, no punctuation, long, 300-page mm. poem. Mm. And I was just talking to somebody about how it's very like Ulysses, but unlike Ulysses, it's American. So I think there's like, as you're reading it, there are intuitive things that you understand, and then there's words, but you get lost in the rhythm of it. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, as when you listen to, really sit down and listen to music, or lyrics, or this kind of poetry, yeah. or anything that, if that's a way, if you're trying to write, that's not meditation to have all of these ideas and words come at you and bring a freshness without them meaning anything. Because there is meaning, but it's not obvious, yeah. like what you were saying about media, where it's given you the message before. Yeah, the yeah. Words. So that's been helping me a little bit. Um, good, this is good. I, I think, in your book, that idea of like, I think you talked about writing, and you told the story about uh, somebody wanted to publish one of your first works and not, and choosing not to do that. Yeah. And the freedom that comes from that. Yeah. And well, maybe just like that idea of like, maybe we don't have to do anything with what we're creating. Well, no, this is, I think this is a very important issue. Um, I told her, I said I wrote six books in two years, and the last three were a trilogy about a black musician. And the first book was about his childhood called Young Blood. And uh, I even enlisted a friend who was a musician, but also starting to get his uh, degree to teach right at Southern Illinois University. Uh, enlisted him to help me learn how to you know, play the piano, because that's what my guy was in the book, in, in Young Blood as a kid. And then the second book, see, I had this ambition. I was going to write a thousand page story. Okay? And it's going to be over three books, a trilogy, right? I mean, this is a young man's foolish, you know, nonsense ambition. I'm going to impress the world. I'm going to write a thousand page story. So the first book is Young Blood. The second book, he's a young man. And then he's an older man in, um, in the third book, right? And I thought, in my early 20s, an old man was like 50 or something. So, you know, I, I know better now. I'll be 70 next month. Okay. Uh, so that was going to be it. And a thousand page um, book. But the first one was accepted for publication by a startup in New York. But by that time, I'd started working with John Gardner. And I asked him, I said, you know, the seventh book I'm doing, I finally, finally think. I can put together what I've always wanted to put together, which is storytelling and philosophy. I couldn't, I didn't know how to do that in the first six. Because my influences, you know, I was influenced by Richard Wright, I was influenced by James Baldwin, everybody's, you know, Red Baldwin, influenced by Johnny Williams, very naturalistic writers. And so I was working in that mode, and the person, the people who were going to take my novel, you know what they said? They said, we like it because it reminds us of Baldwin. And I had to think about that. I don't want to be imitative. I don't want to be derivative, you know? Um, so I said to John Gardner, I said, what do I do? This whole new book that I'm trying to work on, I'm three chapters in, I may not finish it. Who knows if I can finish it? But they're going to take this other book, Young Blood. that's a bird in the hand. I said, what do I do? And he said, well, if you think you're going to have to climb over it later, don't publish it. And that was hard, because I wanted to get published. But I wrote it, and I got the book back. And then nine months later, you know, I finished Faith in a Good Thing. Um, think about it. What do you want your name on? Right? What do you want to endure for your children and grandchildren and future generations? Those first six books, though, I call those apprentice novels. You know, I was learning how to write. I was teaching myself how to write. I could have published Young Blood. Um, would I have had to climb over it? Well, I don't know. Somebody would say, that's really different, <laughs> you know, than this other book. Um, but it wasn't, see, if you're going to write something, you should put your whole heart and soul into it. It should be your best technique, your best thought, your best feeling. This is a gift that you're giving to other people and other generations. I'm trying, it's, it's not about the money. 
I don't care about the money. You know, this is art, all right? You see what I'm saying? I, I had a teaching, you know, my, my day job, okay? This is about a gift to others, and you want to make it the finest gift that you could possibly give to somebody else. So that was, I, that was what I felt after I published Faith in a Good Thing. Then, you know, I see what's at stake here now. I'm not just doing a book to be doing a book or to be a writer or whatever that is. I don't call myself a writer. I don't like all the baggage that comes along with that. I'm a writer. No, I call myself, hey, you know, um, I'm an artist. Sometimes I'll do literary art, and sometimes I'll do visual art because I'm a cartoonist. Sometimes I'll do martial art. But I'm an artist, okay? I'm not whatever a writer is supposed to be. Do not lock yourselves into conceiving yourself in terms of a rigid way of thinking about what a writer is. I mean, I'll give that up, seriously. Hey, sit down, write. Don't worry about what a writer is. Just do your thing. Don't worry about what the expectations of a writer are supposed to be. Now, just enjoy the joy of creation, and then you have a gift that you can give to somebody else. Jim, sir, you've been really patient, thank you. Um, this is a question that's related to uh, a question that was asked a little bit earlier. Uh, you've spoken very eloquently about the way that character and plot intersect to build a narrative. But one of the features of your work that I find most exhilarating is the, uh, the ideas, the uh, philosophical content, the thinking that emerges from the characters acting within a plot. And so I just, I wonder where in the process of throwing out the, the outline, putting an obstacle in front of a character, and doing the deep questioning, that the kind of thinking that comes out, comes out when the character is acting in a plot and the philosophical content enters the work for you. I, it doesn't sound like that's something that's preconceived, but I wonder where in the process it, it comes from. Okay, so there's two ways I can angle in, angle in on this one, and it's two novels, actually. Um, my second novel was Oxford and Dale, which is a, a slave narrative, but it's, it's really an exploration of Eastern philosophy, right? That's the book I was thinking about when asking this question. See, I started out with that conceptually. I started out with the Tim Oxford pictures in my head. I love those pictures so much, right? The Tim Oxford pictures just give you the whole arc of, of the, the, the uh, progress towards enlightenment, right? It's beautifully done. I won't even go into all that because I've talked about it forever. But I had ideas, but I didn't have characters. So what I got to do, if you if you got ideas and no characters, is you got to figure out who your people are. You got to figure out everything. You got to put flesh on the idea, right? That, that's work, okay? The other way, though, was with Middle Passage. I wanted to tell a sea story. And I had this character in mind, I had, you know, uh, events you know, in mind, and it's all about character and event. If you look at that novel, it's just forward movement. There's only one flashback. I mean, I sort of structured it maybe the way you, you would screenplay in certain, certain ways, in terms of pacing, right? But all the ideas were embodied in the world of the character. What is the sea in that novel? It's the void. It's the Buddhist void. The shunyata. You know, the ideas are, re so all I had to do was just pull the ideas. You know, I have a Captain Falcon, you know, just pull it out of, you know, the Al Museri tribe. I want them to be the most spiritual tribe in the whole world, right? Um, the Ur tribe, you know, the, so I drew from India and Africa and other places, you know, for their details. But they, it was all right there. To, and, and that was easier than Oxford and Tale, where I've got to think up, you know, characters. I've got to think, what, what does the landscape mean? As opposed to, you know, in the South, how do we, what, what metaphors um, come to mind when I'm thinking about the Southern landscape of the 19th, you know, 19th century? So it was harder work to get the ideas first and then get the story. Get the story first, the ideas are going to come to the surface. That, though, that's my experience in those two, two books. Um, and I like the latter better, getting the story first. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Because you don't have to work up all that stuff anymore. It's just boom, boom, boom. You know, what happens next? What happens next? Who's saying what to who? You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's fun. But if you got ideas and you don't got characters, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Have you ever experienced or felt so much fear 
by the words that were coming out of you that you limited yourself and didn't allow yourself to give a voice to? Wow. Um, you mean self-censorship, silencing yourself? Yeah, it was just too much coming out. Well, I, there have been times when I've written stories, I know, that I went somewhere, maybe a memory, or something that happened to somebody I knew, or me, and there'd be tears in my eyes. Seriously, tears in my eyes falling onto the typewriter keys. Because that's what I had, I had to go there. And I had to express what I had to express without mincing my words in the most brutal, savage way of confronting whatever it was. And um, I, I've had that with a couple of, uh, there's, there's a place in Dreamer, maybe, where that is, and a couple of short stories. You feel purged. You feel purged afterwards. Um, I'm not sure what kind of writing you're talking about. You're talking about telling a story, you're talking about journal writing or memoir writing. Just telling the story. There's something, see, I used to, I have it in that book there. Um, sometimes I would ask my students at, in, in, at UW, I would say, okay, um, tell me a very, you know, when you're, oh, I made them do plot outlines, by the way. <laughs> they have to do a plot outline every week. So at the end of the quarter, they wrote three stories for me in 10 weeks, but they left the class with seven plot outlines worked out fully that they could take into another workshop or do on their own. And there were questions I would ask them to do on the outline. You know, just two pages, okay? I'm not asking you to write a story, but tell me the working title, tell me the length of the story, tell me the major characters, give me a sense of the difference between story and plot. You could tell a story one way, but what's the plot? And the perfect example for that is look at how E.M. Forrester, you know, distinguishes between story and plot. And then I wanted to, you know, there's like seven things I asked them to do. And so they had one of those to do every week. But then in class, I would sometimes say to them, here's something else I want to know about your, your story, and mainly your character, your protagonist. I want to know what they fear the most. And when I say what they fear the most, I don't mean snakes and spiders. I mean, what is their greatest social fear? What is the one thing in this world that they do not ever want to have to face up to or deal with? And then that's what you make them deal with, okay? And that is not easy, because you're pulling, you are. You're pulling that out of yourself. That's where you, see, when I asked them, what is your character's greatest fear? They heard what I was saying. They, they knew I was saying, what's your greatest fear? And how are you going to confront that, right? And, you know, that, that's a hard place to go to. And you know what happens when people go there? I see passages like that on the pages of a novel or the pages of a story. It's so powerful. We are no longer in the realm talking literary criticism, okay? We're not talking about something we're going to talk about in terms of structuralism or phenomenology or semiotics or deconstruction. You have somebody's raw beating heart on the page, right? And that is powerful. It transcends all of the critical methods we're talking about. And you know who is really good at that, in my opinion? The late writer James Allen McPherson. He got a Pulitzer Prize, right, for um, Hue and Cry, was it Hue and Cry, the first book? Or Elbow Room. It was, yeah, I met Jim. We were at different places together. And he was a genius. I mean, this guy, if I remember correctly, he was working as a janitor at Harvard, right? And then he went on to um, get a law degree. And uh, we were talking actually about James Allen McPherson just the other night. He's the only man I've ever seen who had no ego armory. No. I wonder how does he move through the world? He's usually quiet, but when he would say something, it would be brilliant, right? But this guy, I mean, no ego on him. I used to worry about that, you know? I mean, writers have big egos, you know, to survive. You gotta have an ego. You gotta believe what you're doing is worth it. Jim didn't have that. And then, I think it's in his collection of essays, Corn Crates, I want to say, he has a story I may talk about it in there, I'm not sure. But what it is, it's about his father. And when J 
Jim was a father in this little southern town somewhere. His father came up with an invention. Invention that would do something like save electricity, preserve, you know, just save electricity. Because this was a Jim Crow South, though, white people would not let him patent that. They would not let him bring that gift to the world. So his father became the town trunk. Sometimes on the weekend, you know, he would hear, oh, your dad's in jail again, right? His father was a brilliant man. Brilliant man. And I guess he worked as like an electrician. So one day, Jim's moving us through the story, right, which is a sad story. Then one day, he's standing with his father in the kitchen. And, and there's a socket, you know? His father's gonna fix a socket. So he takes out the light bulb, runs his finger up, grabs his son's hand. The son's hand is holding the father, and he's got, the son's grabbing this to ground him. If one of them lets go, they're gonna die, right? One of them lets go. You got the power of the universe, electricity, surging through this boy and his father. And you know what the father says when he looks down at his son, young Jim? He says, you know I've never hurt you, bud. I thought, oh my God. That, I mean, it just, I was melting in my seat. I was just liquefied. I said, that is power. Okay, that is power. But he had to go somewhere deep to bring that out. That pain, you know, of his father during that era of Jim Crow segregation. And, and, and the potential he had that he couldn't realize. You know, sometimes you, you have to go there. And it's not easy. But I think you feel better after you do. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your, your question. Yes, yes, ma'am. Say something about the difference between writing a story or a novel and screenwriting. Between writing a story or a novel or screenwriting? Well, I mean, <laughs> no. Okay, I, I put it. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never written a screenplay on my own. I've always been a hired gun. Somebody would always come to me and say, this is the project we want to do. Usually director, producer, or something like that. And so I'm a hired gun. I write their story for them. Um, and that, you know, is one kind of thing. Um, I will say this, and uh, I said this at a um, uh, uh, reading the other day at Elias Bay by Mark Sarvis. And, the, there was a gentleman who heard me say it, and he wrote to me the next day to question my metaphor. But I, I still hold by it. Um, if you're a novelist, well, think about it this way, a movie. And at the end, you see the credits, right? Credits roll. You got director, you got the actors, you got the grip, you got the, the lighting person, you got this high hairstylist, you got the costume. You know, you got all these people it took to make this movie. Well, if you're writing a novel, you are all those people. You gotta be every character. You gotta be the hairstylist. You know, you gotta be the costume. You gotta, no, you do it all. You know, you gotta, you gotta do it all. Um, and there's a kind of, I don't know, a total freedom in being able to do that. On the other hand, if you're working on a project, you're one of people. And see, there's a difference. When you work on a project with really good people, director and actors and so forth, what the result is of all those people working together is greater than the sum of, of their parts. Everybody's a pro, bringing something special to the table, right? They are, everybody's got experience. And so, in the rare occasions when you, you do get a good movie, it's because everybody has contributed to it. The writer just being one person. But nobody goes to work until there's a script. You know, writing, if you write for Hollywood, you get paid well. Um, but you also get lowball in other, other ways, in terms of respect. You know, I mean, seriously, I mean, who's doing the work? It's the actor. The actor's got to get out there on the stage, and they're the ones putting their, you know what, on the line. Their body is, you know, their art. The writer's behind the camera, okay? Um, so I, I give it up to the actors. I give it up to the directors, too. But the writer, nobody goes to work until the writer turns something in. And then you can figure out, okay, this is the role I'm going to play. But if you're writing a novel, you are everybody in it. You are every role in it, right? And it, it stretches you. You know, you got to learn. You got to, you got to grow. Other. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Wait. Uh, my question is. Oh. Where are you? I'm. <laughs> oh, you're way back there in the dark. Okay, I see. Totally down the background. 
Um, my question is, how has Buddhism influenced you as an artist or influenced your writing, if at all? Well, I, I, uh, I take refuge in the Buddha Dharma. I started meditating when I was 14 years old, the first time I ever did it. And it was the most incredible experience that I ever had. Um, it, uh, you know, I think it's the most civil. I'll be, probably, I'll be blunt with you. I've done two books on Buddhism. Um, what is it? Taming, um, Turning the Wheel, uh, essays on Buddhism and writing, and the other one's Taming the Ox, uh, which is a more recent one. But I think it is the most civilized way that one can move through this world. Buddhism is nonviolent, it is non materialistic, and it is non dualistic. And I think that we could all benefit from less violence, you know, in our lives, and also understanding that whatever it is you're dealing with in this life, I don't care what it is, it's you. That's what we mean by non dualistic. Whatever it is you're dealing with, it's you. I'm going to leave you with that thought. I'm stealing that line, by the way, from somebody else. Um, but it stuck with me as soon as I heard it. I'm very non-dualistic in that sense. Um, I'm very non-materialistic in that sense, too. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it, for my life, it's the only way I could live. But I'm not, saying, I'm not proselytizing. I'm not going to do that. Because Buddhists don't proselytize. You should not... Get interested in Buddhism. Seriously, you should not do it unless you really need it. It's not a game. It's about death. It's about preparation for death. It's about living here and now. You know, I, before I came over here, I sat in meditation. I, um, I sat down in my zafu that I've been sitting on since 1981 when I got it in San Francisco. And I, I have a kind of satch that I just, now I can put it around my neck. Um, because this person here, Sharon Skeeter, she and I just spent three weeks lecturing in India. And we went to Bodh Gaya. And Bodh Gaya is where the Buddha experienced awakening. And we meditated right in front of the, Bo the descendant of the Bodhi tree, right? A powerful experience. I wanted to go to India since I was like a teenager. Well, why did I sit in meditation before I came over here? I'll tell you why. It's because I wanted to get out of my head what I was doing yesterday. I want to get out of my head what I got to do tomorrow. I want to be right here, right now, fully present with all of you at this moment because this is the only moment in time. We can't live in the past because it's gone and we can't live in the future because it will never come. There is only the present moment right here, right now. And so I, I sat in formal meditation because that would make me prepare to come and spend this time with you. Now, one of the things I really enjoyed is that uh, last week, I guess, we went to hear uh, Peter Levitt as a town hall. Uh, last time. Huh? Yeah. Try to get my Oh, out. we're out? Oh, oh, okay. Does this, does this work? Oh, okay. Uh, we went to see Peter Levitt at uh, Finney Neighborhood Center and as a town hall thing. I never heard of Peter Levitt, but the person he was going to do the event with is a friend of my daughter, and she said, your dad should come. And I said, my daughter, okay, tell her I'll come. And I got there, and Peter Levitt is reading his poetry, and he's Buddhist, and we're in the same lineage. I took my vows nine, ten years ago in the Soto Zen tradition with mendicant monk Claude Anderson Thomas, who walks this world for peace. Um, he's, you know, in the Sotos and tradition, the same, the same for Peter Levitt. And I was listening to this man, and it was like, he was saying everything in my heart and mind. This is a man who lives on an island in Canada. He's 70 years old, still goes out and chops wood. But he made, it was so clear, crystal clear, the wisdom that he was expressing. I said, yeah, you know, I'm re I really needed that tonight. <laughs> you know, I really needed to be here to hear this because Buddhism is the most simple thing in the bloody world. Why do I say that? Because in one of the sutras, the Buddha is with his disciples. It might be Ananda, whose name means bliss. And they're in a forest. And the Buddha says, Ananda, how many leaves do you think there are on the trees? And Ananda says, oh, I think it's infinite. There's thousands, hundreds of thousands of leaves. And the says, that's probably true. And he reaches down and scoops up just a handful, like four or five. 
And he shows him to Ananda, and he says, this is a number of teachings that I have. Just four or five fundamental basic truths. And they all interconnect. And they all reinforce each other. And since 2,600 years ago, they have generated all of Buddhist tradition, all of the sutras, Abhidharma literature, you know, Vinaya, the rules of the monks, incredible amount of endless commentary from just a few basic truths that you have to accept. Because the Buddha said, don't accept anything on authority, don't accept it, you know, because you think the person saying this is wise. You accept something when you feel it in the depths of your own experience. So I say, you know, if you're interested in Buddhism, that's cool, but you, if you really want to get the wound of suffering out of you, you know, that, that's when you want Buddhism. Otherwise, if you were raised in a particular religion, you should check that out first. I mean, this, I'm, this is, a, no, really, this is the Dalai Lama talking. If you were raised Jewish, if you were raised, you know, Christian, you should check that out if you're looking for spiritual, uh, spiritual practice, right? But if, if that's not working for you, that's not working for you, the, the religion, you know, you were born into, I was born a cradle Christian, okay? Um, and and then, then look at Buddhism, because um, that's when people really come to it with the passion for awakening. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be funny, what I call fuzzy bunny Buddhism. Um, you know, it's, no, this is serious. This is about death and life. This is about the end of suffering. This is about seeing clearly. So I, I, you know, I, I'm, I could go on about that forever, so I'll shut up. We, other questions related to writing. To, uh, why well, see one lady, uh, and, oh, and somebody way over there. Could you, you one second? Oh, you asked one. There's a gentleman standing way back there. Thank you for being patient. You don't have a chair. <laughs> person. I have um, a story that I've been writing for several years and I, you know, try hard every day to not write a new thing about the thing that I'm thinking about right now. <laughs> but I think that the difference between starting a story and feeling the interest in the beginning of something that reminds you of something that could lead to a story is the decision of who could exist in that place of what you're thinking of, you know, who's smoking the tobacco and why that's important to them and what they're doing that makes that important to them. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, I told you before, you know, I was like trained as a journalist, right? Well, one of the virtues of that is you learn to live with every day the six basic storytelling questions. You, you, we're talking about tobacco, right? Well, the question is, who is using tobacco? And you've got the other ones, who, what, why, when, how, where. You have to answer those as a newspaper reporter, right? Same thing for a writer. You've got to answer all of those questions if you're telling a story. And getting in the habit of that 
Because that's what's going to come up with an editor if you don't answer all those questions. Who, what, why, when, where, and how. You have to answer those. But, but, but this brings up another matter. Is, is Paulette here? Did she make it here tonight? Paulette? She was, she was out in the corridor. She was out there? Is, did she take off? She was taking photographs. That's right. Hey! 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 <laughs> Paulette? Yes. We have been corresponding? Yes, thank you so much. How about your book? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> she has a book coming out for beginning writers. Seriously. I'm reading part of it. Everything she says is right. She doesn't make any mistakes. But, but, here's okay. the thing. This is a book for people, if I'm not mistaken, who have always wanted to write but don't know how to start. Right, don't know where to begin. And so you give them lots of really great wisdom. Uh, no, seriously, no. This is, it's not out yet though, right? I, August. August? Yeah. Okay, this is something we want to look forward to. And um, I owe her a blurb uh, <laughs> for the book. Um, but don't go away, okay? Because you might seriously be able to respond to some of the questions much better than me. Um, yeah. Hmm? Will we go on for an hour? Yeah, can we just, can we see, I don't know if this works, but can we see a show of hands of how many other people have questions, and then we can sort of determine what to do here? I see. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So, so, would you like to take a break and then come, and then reconvene, or should we have four more questions and then... Okay, so those people who just had their hands up, or three, whatever it was, we're going to take those questions, yes, and, and then These lights are really say goodnight. Nice. <laughs> I don't think this works, but you got oh, plan. Yes, oh, okay, we said three or four more questions. Um, you know what? I'm going to make you wait because you were first, I think. And so we're going to circle all the way back around to you. So you get the first and last question, right? This lady here, ma'am. Hi, I have a writing group and they're great for keeping me moving forward, but I want to make sure I'm getting the most out of their comments. Do you have any advice for really incorporating people's comments and advice into your writing as you move forward? Okay, so you're in a writing group, right? And like you guys share manuscripts and give comments to each other. Um, a lot of my former students did that after the class was over. The, the really energized ones would go over somebody's house on a regular basis and meet. Um, I, I'm not sure, can you repeat the question again? How do you... I, you know, I, they have comments on each story and I don't know oh. if I'm like incorporating them into my future stories so much as just like fixing each story as I go along. Do you have advice for growing as a writer based on what you're from other people? Well, yeah, I mean, you know what you, you know what you want your story to be, I mean, tentatively, right? If you get a comment in the margin of the story that is way out of court, you know that, you know, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, I can't really pay attention to that one. Um, you're going to get a lot of feedback. I mean, sometimes too many cooks, you know, can spoil the meal. Um, so it's entirely up to you. You know, you got to really know in your heart whether this fixes your story, improves your story, or whether it takes you away from what you really feel, you know, the story should be. That's what I think, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, wait. No, sir. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Yes. Uh, my question is similar to hers. What, what was your approach to creating an atmosphere in your class? where people were uh, both supportive of each other and also um, offering suggestions and feedback. You, you mentioned a couple of things, like you have a sharp critique of something, you got to show up with two or three alternatives that you can offer. Yeah. Then, were there other tips and approaches? Because I, I facilitate groups and I'm often uh, in groups and it'd be nice to know how you pull that together. Well, I don't know if I'm doing anything different than you're doing it, but I know what I did on the first day of class. I told my students, this is not going to be like any other creative writing class you've ever had. You're going to do exercises for me. You're going to do, out of the art of fiction, when I first started teaching at UW, 
Oh, they gave me a beginning short story writing classes. They met three times a week for an hour. And so my students would have one of Gardner's exercises, 30 of them, right, for every day we met. That's from the back of the art of fiction. They would come out of there with 30 exercises done in 10 weeks. Then I added the requirement, three stories I wanted, and I wanted for the first two, I wanted to um, full length full length story. Well, no, not to qualify this a little bit, because over the years, you know, my classes changed. I modified them, you know, based upon student needs. So yeah, they did three stories for me, but the first story was a short short, a thousand words. Okay, and they could do that by the next week it was due. Then they had more time to do the second story, and they're revising the first story for me as they're doing the second one, right? Then the third story came in on the last day of class, and nobody saw it but me. I would take it home, I would read it, you know, mark it up, send it back to them. Um, so that's how we did three stories, right, in that period of time, as well as 30 gardener exercises. And I had them keep a writer's journal. And some got so hooked on that, keeping you know, the journal. See, you shouldn't be walking around and getting an idea, a great line comes to you, you hear some overheard at Starbucks, it's a, a dialogue exchange, you should be walking around and not writing that down in your writer's journal. That's those, you could use that later so well, you know, uh, when you're writing a story. You, seriously, I mean, do, writer's journals are important, and there's some classic ones. Camus are incredible, Hawthorne, you know, this is, you are observing the world every day of your life and you should be paying attention to it. You know, character descriptions, you know, you put that in your journal. Uh, I got journals going back to 1972. Anyway, they had to do that for me, uh, keep a journal, and I wanted to see it midterm. I wasn't really care what they put in there, I just wanted to make sure they put something in there. And at the end of the quarter, I asked to see it again, because I, I wanted to see if they had more in there. But there were students who didn't want to give it up over the weekend because they had nothing to put their thoughts and you know and impressions and all that in. So I understood that. I mean, your writer's journal is your memory aid. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is really, really important to keep that. So those were my requirements for my students. Dave Gooderson, um, Gary Hawks, um, a lot of people took my classes and went through that boot camp, you know, as, as I described it. Uh, but here's what I told them the first day of class. I said, this is not my class. This, you know, this, you, not, you haven't taken a class like this before, probably. This is not my class. It's yours. And you have to be responsible, not just to me, but to each other. If somebody's got to give a critique of somebody else on a particular day, and that person doesn't show up, Everybody in class needs to be able to step up and do that critique for the person, you know, who's not there. You know, and so my, and they had to do it twice during the quarter. You can't be shy, you can't hide. In my class, you're going to critique somebody else twice and be critiqued two times. So it's their class. I'm just here as, I don't know, master of ceremonies, ringleader, I don't know what you call me, but I'm here just, you know, to, to give us some structure and direction. And that's why the classes were really enjoyable for me. Um, people really got into, you know, helping each other. And through art, you know, through art. Uh, we have two more questions. I, I could go on forever yet. Yeah. Uh, oh, more. Uh, this gentleman. And then you, and then we'll have five questions, okay? Okay, yes, sir. Hi there. Um, I learned about you, like, on Sunday when I saw an ad for this event. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did too, really. Additionally, I went to the library and got that writer's book on Monday, that one that you're talking about, and read most of half of it oh. for tonight. Oh, so I was really glad that too. One of the things I noticed was how well you interlaced uh, quotes from other literary works, other thoughts, and I was just curious about your relationship between reading and writing. And how you get all that material, how do you have time to read a bunch of stuff, and then how do you keep track of it and infuse it in your writing, that kind of, how does hey. that affect the... I, I, have a, I have a whole, thank you for that question, seriously, I have I a whole chapter on it. It might be later on in the book. Oh, huh? <laughs> well, no, yeah, you haven't gotten it, but it, it's called on reading, okay. and hey, come on, it, you know, I, I was once starting a book somewhere, 
and it was a line of people, and this young man comes up to me, and he says, I want to be a writer, but I don't like to read. <laughs> I mean, come on, what are you saying here, you know? You, how are you going to learn to write if you don't read? And you got to read hungrily. you got to be passionate. You gotta, oh, man, I, I, I can't even, um, see, these are readers, okay? Seattle people read books. You know, per capita, we got more readers, you know, than we used to than other places. You gotta be a reader. There's just no way around this. Um, you gotta want to read all kinds of things too. And so you write in your book that you're, you're writing your you do your work from whatever midnight to five a.m. Right? I usually work until yeah so five or six. Yeah. yeah. And then you sleep it off, and then your wife comes home. When do you read? Oh, when do I? <laughs> Hey, I may be reading, I may be reading at 3 in the morning. Oh, no, seriously. I've had friends' manuscripts that I've had to go through real fast. Uh, one of my former editors on Wednesday had to go to a sales meeting, and he had to pitch the book he selected, I won't tell you the title, to the sales force. And he'd sent me the manuscript before I, February, before February 13th, when I had to go to India. I couldn't take it with me. I didn't have the time. I was traveling. I was lecturing. So he wrote to me like a couple of days ago, and he said, if you could just send something that I could take into the sales meeting. And so I said, okay, you know, um, John, I'm, I'm going to try to do this. Uh, I read three hours, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, I can't remember, but maybe Monday morning. And it's like 119 pages, and I got a, I got a sense of the book, you know, so I was able then to um, send him um, a quote that he said he was going to read verbatim to the sales department. And, and I mean, you know what that's about, right? You get an editor, they, he was my editor, actually, for, for The Way of the Writer at Scrivener, but he moved on to HarperCollins, because he made him this deal. He said, we're going to let you publish the writers you want to publish. And so he sent me this manuscript because he said, I think you're going to like this, right? Well, I know what this is like. He's in a position where he believes as an editor in this book, but he's got to meet the salespeople, and they're going to ask questions like, okay, this writer is new, nobody knows him, or this writer's published, how, how, many, how, much, how much did the previous book sell? You know, he's got to get through all of that to get this writer out here so we can read him. And um, in my experience, when editors who care about literary fiction get that book through the salespeople and out there in the world, they celebrate. They open up a bottle of champagne because it's hard. This is the dilemma of art and commerce, right? Um, it's, it's really hard. So sometimes I'll be reading like I had to do from like 3 to 6 in the morning to get that done. Um, or, you know, anytime. I mean, you're taking the light rail. You could be reading, you know. You could got all the chance. You gotta read. I mean, I, I, you know, <laughs> I will not beat this to death, um, but you gotta read. Um, yes, ma'am, you are next. Um, I'm curious if you have a comment. There's a, a lot of talk of now in my writing group about cultural appropriation. Yeah. And two writers in my group are writing about two different races that they are not. Um, the stories are very strong and very good writers, um, yeah. and they've gotten some feedback from the literary community that they should not be writing about races other than their own. Okay, could you talk about that just a little bit more? I mean, who's giving the feedback like that? Literary agents. Literary agents are saying to them that they should not be writing outside of their race? The agents don't want the societal cultural feedback that would be against these writers and potentially against the that's a, this is a very big question, but it's, it's very much a question that's with us right now. I know, for example, you got to get a movie made in Hollywood, and you got a black story. You say it could be one of my novels or something. You're going to you're gonna have to have a black director to do this, or you're going to run headlong into a whole lot of flack if you don't have a black director interpreting this material. There's all kinds of reasons for why you should have you should have a black director, right? <coughs> but in my new story collection. I mean, I write from the first person viewpoint of Plato. Does this mean I can't write about Plato? I write a third person story about a Japanese Zen abbot who is visited by a black American woman. Am I not supposed to write about Japan, 
even though I have studied Buddhism and what it means to be an abbot, and I have a friend who was one of two white abbots there, the only two in, you know, in Tokyo, uh, I have another story about the Buddha. And it's during his six, is it six years? Yeah, when he was an ascetic, and that's still third person. I mean, if you immerse yourself in your subject and you know it well enough, then you ought to be able to write about it. And I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm saying. Andre de, de Buse, I think that's how you pronounce it, the third, House of Sand and Fog, he alternates between a white girl, right, who's losing her house, and a man from, I think it's Iran or something, who's, who's here in America, and he tries to buy her house, you know, when it goes on the market. And so it's a fight over this house in California. And what could be more of a symbol, you know what I'm saying, than, than that for the struggle in America? Well, Andre, I know what he did. He has people he knows who are from the Middle East, and he sat down with them, and he probably tape recorded, asked them questions, then when he had the manuscript done, he passed it by them to see if he really screwed up anywhere right, and got feedback. I think that's how you do this. You are humble, you do not make assumptions, you know, you, you study something, you talk to people who belong to that race, class, or gender, or cultural orientation, and, you, and then you let them see what you've done and see if they will give you a thumbs up on it. So I don't, I don't believe in that, locking yourself in a cage. I don't believe in that, because what's going to happen to the imagination, right? How you, you can't create that one. Thank you, this is really important. But this, well, we could talk about this for a long time. Um, two more, one more, are we? How, how many? Last one. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we're having fun. All right, this guy, this gentleman hasn't had a chance to talk, please. Oh, yes, please. And I want to mention that the book is about India and in all its glory, and not only the good parts, the bad parts too. So your suggestion that the person who's not from a certain race talk to the people of the other race and get their buy-in comes into conflict because this book basically was not welcomed by some of the upper middle class people in India because it explored India in all its bad sides too. So I think you run into conflict. I wonder if you have any suggestions about that. All right, what's the conflict? Tell me again. Uh, well, it's about people in India, and they are treated very badly by certain people in India. And so when this, uh, and it got a Booker Prize, and there were certain people who were saying that this is the Western world wanting to sort of put down India, but it's nothing like that. I'm from Arundhati the Roy. Huh? Arun Dutti Roy. God of small things. God of small things. The God of small things. Uh, so the author is Indian? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not the same thing, right? It's not the same thing the young lady is asking. No. But it's more like, if you want to get buy-in from people who don't like your book and they happen to belong to a certain tribe, a race, what have you, I don't know if the outcome is exactly the best outcome for the readers. I don't know. I'm asking you. Well, I, I thank you for that question, especially because I was just in, in India, <laughs> northern India, southern India, Delhi, I saw the Taj, right, I was all over India for the first time in my life, and I think I know what you're saying, there's a sensitivity there, that if you're critical, especially if you're critical, right, of the government, you know, that could be for really problematic, um, I recommend everybody here make a trip to India at some point in your life because you'll have your eyes opened up. You'll have your eyes completely and your mind blown. It's one of the oldest places in the world. It is the biggest democracy, right, in the world. But it is not a country that doesn't have problems at the same time. And some of them are really serious. And the caste system is still alive and well. Um, and there's poverty. And 70% of the people in India cannot read. Um, or add, or subtract. There are problems with infrastructure. There are a lot of problems. So yeah, if somebody is going to talk about something, you know, and the people who are being talked about, they may be upset. That, but that's the truth. See, I think that I think you have to really adhere to the truth. You can't, you can't hide that. Again, you know, I was trained as an old journalist, so I, I think we have a reason why why are we call journal, you know, newspapers the the. Um, what do you call it? Third estate? Fourth estate? Um, fourth estate? Yeah. What? 
I think it's fifth the state. Fifth, we're getting different numbers here. I forget. But it's to keep government in line. It is to expose corruption. And that was the old ideal of journalists, you know, and represented by Woodward and Bernstein, you know, and Watergate and the whole thing. But yeah, this is about truth, too. It's not just about discovery, it's about truth, I think. Thank you so much for being so patient. I, I hate to end this.